Hi everyone and welcome to this video that it is introducing software defined storage that you can implement using Windows Server, in particular Windows Server 2012 or 2. My name is Aiden Finn, I'm the technical sales lead of Micro Warehouse and I'm a Hyper-V MVP. I've been working in IT since 1996. Um, as I said, I'm a Hyper-V MVP, about 70 of us around the world. And my background, I've been working with Windows Server and Desktop and System Center and Virtualization, general IT infrastructure in the Microsoft space since I left college. I tweet as at Joe underscore Elway and I blog on AidenFin.com and I also write for the Petri IT knowledge base on Petri.com and I've been the author, contributing author of several books and as I said, I'm the technical sales lead of Micro Warehouse. Now the solution I'm going to be talking about today is based on hardware that is produced by data on storage that we distribute at Micro Warehouse and using Microsoft software, namely Windows Server, is used by Hyper-V and it can be managed using System Center. And all of these products are distributed throughout the European Union by Micro Warehouse. Micro Warehouse is a distributor based in Dublin, Ireland. We can be found on www.mwh.ie. And as distributors, we sell to resellers. We don't sell to the end consumer that's going to be using this product. We sell to companies that are consulting companies, system integrators, who sell that product onto that end company or user that's going to sell the product. And as I said, we can sell this produce within the European Union. In this session, I'm going to introduce you to software-defined storage and how it's deployed and used within Windows Server. I'm going to look at a few technologies, in particular storage spaces and the scale-out file server. And we can use that scale-out file server architecture to do something called Hyper-V on SMB3, which is Microsoft's strategic way of deploying virtualization in a data center. We'll also use that scale-out file server architecture for other workloads such as IIS or SQL Server. And at the very end, I'm going to give you some indicative uh, retail pricing and um, just so you have an idea of what this sort of solution will cost. So, what is software-defined storage? In the past, you've been deploying something that is referred to as hardware-defined storage. Typically, you're using RAID, RAID 1, RAID 10, RAID 5, RAID 6, in a server. And a storage area network does something called storage virtualization that will reveal itself as RAID. It's an inflexible solution. It's based on hardware and it's from a single vendor. Now all this combined together makes it very difficult to automate because each vendor will have different tools that don't necessarily have scripting or uh, management solutions uh, or central management solutions and they are usually very expensive. So if you buy a SAN from company A you have to buy your disks from company A and they charge a premium for those disks and for the firmware that they put on those disks. Software defined storage or SDS uses commodity hardware. You're not locked into a single vendor. It's flexible, meaning you can buy a JBOD from one company and disks from another manufacturer, and SSDs from another manufacturer, and SAS cards from another manufacturer. It's up to you. Now, if you work with a good JBOD manufacturer, they'll actually have a HCL or a hardware compatibility list of their own, and they'll recommend man um, not just manufacturers, but models of units that you can purchase from any source of your choice. The solution is easy to automate. It's based on Windows Server and System Center. So if you deploy the core Windows Server product, you can do it all using PowerShell. Or if you deploy the bigger solution using System Center, you can do bare metal deployment of the entire storage solution from the comfort of your desk. And the entire solution is lower cost storage. That's a key thing. And one of the big markets we're seeing eating this up is a hosting or cloud companies. In other words, companies that value low cost but still highly performing storage. They can't afford to purchase traditional block storage or they'll go out of business because their competition will offer that cheaper storage. The technologies that we're looking at in Windows Server 2012 or 2 are storage spaces, which is an alternative to RAID. Now please do not think this is Windows RAID of the past. Windows RAID sucked. It sucked royally. 
Storage spaces is something that was introduced in Windows Server 2012 and improved in 2012 or 2 and worked very similarly to the disk virtualization technologies that you see in Asan. We can connect to storage using SMB3. This is an alternative to iSCSI, Fiber Channel or FCOE. So we can have our Hyper-V hosts or SQL servers store their data basically on file shares and connect to it with low latency, high throughput connections on SMB3. A protocol that's designed to beat iSCSI and Fiber Channel using some very nice networking technologies. And then there's a scale out file server architecture that combines all the other pieces of the software solution from Microsoft into an architecture that gives a scalable, transparent failable or transparent failover and continuously available file shares. So we get low cost, high performance, highly available, in fact continuously available file shares, and we can store our virtual machines, or our databases, or our web content on that SAN alternative architecture. Let's look at the first of those technologies, which is storage spaces. As I said earlier, this is an alternative to hardware RAID. And it is not Windows RAID of the past. It is very similar to what you do in your SAN console. You have a number of disks that reside in disk trays. In the case of a data center, these disk trays will be JBOTs that you'll find in a special category in the Windows Server Hardware Compatibility List. Do a search for Windows Server Hardware Compatibility List, then go into Storage, and then go into Storage Spaces, and you'll see all the various different vendors and models that Microsoft has certified for storage spaces. Each of the disks by default that's in a JBOT is an individual disk, and would appear in Disk Manager as an individual disk. But when we aggregate those disks into a storage pool, they disappear from Disk Management, and are managed as a unit or a storage pool. And from that storage pool, we create fault-tolerant virtual disks, or as you might have called them in the past, LUNs. And then we'll use those LUNs to store our data. We have different types of fault tolerance that we can have for those LUNs or virtual disks. Here, I'm going to give you a high-level view of what that fault tolerance would be like. I have a bunch of individual disks that I've aggregated into a storage pool. And the first thing I'm going to do is create myself a virtual disk, and at this point, I'm going to create a two-way mirror virtual disk. And this is very similar to RAID 10. When we write a block to disk 1, that block is duplicated to disk 2. When we write a block to disk 3, it's duplicated to disk 4. So we get high levels of fault tolerance without any sacrifices to read or write performance. Yes, we lose 50% of our storage capacity, but we're getting those disks really cheap, and we're getting great read and write performance. We also have something called three-way mirror, which writes the blocks to three disks. So we have higher levels of fault tolerance. We have a simple virtual disk, which has no fault tolerance at all. If I lose one of those physical disks, I would actually lose that simple virtual disk. And then we have different forms of parity. And this is kind of like what you get with your RAID 5. Parity is not supported for non-archive workloads. In other words, if you want to have a repository of uh, old files that you want to keep around, you might store them on a parity virtual disk. But if you want to store production virtual machines, you won't store them on a parity virtual disk because that wouldn't be supported. Some of the features of storage spaces are listed here. So, obviously, we have disk fault tolerance. If I lose a physical disk, my virtual disks stay online. We have some repair processes that are built in and are automated. We have two choices in Windows Server 2012 or 2. We can implement the traditional hot spare where we can designate one or more disks to kick in and do a recovery process. Now, the time for that recovery process is, well, it really depends on how much disk we're restoring or how much data we're restoring and how fast that individual disk is, just like you would see in a SAN. 
It's a great solution for lightly managed environments. However, if you are managing the environment and you can ensure that there's always some free space on your physical capacity, then the parallelized restore is the way to go. And this uses the free space of each healthy disk to restore the replica data that was lost on the failed disk. So instead of using a single hot spare to recover the data, we're actually using the IOPS of each healthy disk to recover the data, and we get a much faster restore. We can do tiered storage. In other words, we can blend the speed of SSD with the affordable capacity of 7200 RPM large disks. So we can take something like a 4 terabyte or a 6 terabyte drive, which normally we wouldn't tolerate in a virtualized environment. But when we blend it with fast SSDs, and we put their hot data or hot blocks on the SSDs and the cold blocks on the 7200 RPM drives, we get the best of both worlds. That block placement is automated using a heat map optimization process that runs by default at 1 a.m. every night. And if you want, you can pin an entire file to either the hot tier or the cold tier. If you do have tiered storage, one of the side benefits is an automated feature called Writeback Cache. By default, each virtual disk will get 1 gig of additional SSD capacity to use as a write cache. And that 1 gig capacity is what Microsoft actually recommends. When a volume experiences high uh, spikes in write activity, the Writeback Cache will be engaged to absorb those write spikes. And the data is written to the fast SSD tier. So it's not like a write cache in your storage controller that would be bypassed using write through. The data is actually written to physical disk and committed to physical disk. And later it's moved from the SSD tier to the HD tier if that's the appropriate place. If you want to implement storage spaces in a computer room or data center, you are going to need certified hardware. And one of the vendors that produces that certified hardware is Data on Storage, which is a brand that we distribute at Micro Warehouse. Here I've shown you two of the JBODs that are produced by Data on. There is the 2U DNS 1640, which allows you to have 24 2.5 inch drives, both SSD and HDD. It allows two servers to physically connect via SAS cables to the pack of the unit using fault tolerant SAS modules and SAS cables and it features fault tolerant power supplies as well. The large capacity DNS 1660 allows you to have 60, that's six zero, three and a half inch drives, both SSD and HDD. It allows four servers to directly connect to two fault tolerant SAS modules and it also features fault tolerant power supplies. Storage Spaces is a cluster supported storage solution. Traditional solutions we would have used include SAS SAN, iSCSI SAN, Fiber Channel SAN, FCOE SAN, and PCI RAID, which was added in Windows Server 2012. But now you can deploy one or more JBODs that are connected to your clustered servers using SAS cables and implemented or implement clustered storage spaces within your failover cluster. Each virtual disk that you deploy within those clustered storage spaces will be implemented as a cluster shared volume, making it active active across each of the cluster nodes. And we can use that volume in a number of cluster scenarios, two of which you're going to see today in this presentation. So let's have a look at a simple storage spaces design. A few of them actually. The first one is a commonly used one in a small medium enterprise and it's one that we actually use ourselves in micro warehouse for our own production systems. We want or wanted a pair of Hyper-V hosts in a failover cluster but traditionally that would have required a SAN. Now for a small medium enterprise that SAN is going to cost quite a bit of money but with storage spaces that cluster becomes much more affordable. So I've got my two Hyper-V nodes that I'm going to deploy as a cluster. I have my JBOD. I've chosen the 2U DNS 1640 that can have up to 24 two and a half inch drives. You'll notice on the back the two power modules and the two SAS modules. 
Each server has a dual interface 6 gigabits per second SAS card. Now don't let that 6 gigabits per second fool you. What that actually means is that each cable that's plugged into the SAS interfaces has four 6 gigabits per second interface or ports or channels. Each cable therefore has 24 gigabits per second of throughput and with load balanced MPIO we actually have 48 gigabits of throughput from each server to the JBOT. That's a lot of bandwidth for our storage. And each server is cross connected to the fault tolerance SAS modules in the JBOT. We'd install Windows Server, deploy failover clustering, create our clustered storage spaces which aggregates and creates virtual disks using the disks in the JBOD. And from those virtual disks we'll create a pair of cluster shared volumes. And those cluster shared volumes reside in the JBOD. Then we'll deploy Hyper-V, run our virtual machines on these two nodes, and store the virtual machine files on those cluster shared volumes in the JBOD. And there we have an affordable two node Hyper-V cluster for the small medium enterprise or branch office. Here we're going to have four Hyper-V hosts instead of two Hyper-V hosts and they're going to connect into a single DNS 1660 JBOD that has 63 and a half inch drives. You'll note that the JBOD has a pair of SAS modules that allow four servers to connect into each module using SAS cables. Each server is going to have a dual interface SAS card rated at 12 gigabits per second. The reason we've gone with a 12 gigabits per second card is because it gives us better performance even with a 6 gigabits per second JBOD purely because it's able to handle the number of drives that we'll be putting into this unit. Each SAS card is connected to a different SAS module on the back of the JBOD, giving us fault tolerance for MPIO. Now we cluster the servers, create clustered storage spaces in the JBOD, have a number of cluster shared volumes residing on the JBOD, run our virtual machines on the Hyper-V hosts, and store the virtual machine files on those cluster shared volumes that live in the JBOD. The solutions we've been looking at there are great for small medium enterprises and for branch offices but there's a tidier solution called a cluster in a box or a CIB. The concept of a cluster in a box is that we can have two or more blade servers in a single enclosure and also have the JBOD or storage capacity of that cluster in that enclosure. All the wiring between the servers and the JBOD is hardwired. All we've got to do is supply external network connectivity and power connectivity into the enclosure. Data on makes two high level modules or models of cluster in a box units. There's the CIB9220, which comes in a storage enhanced and a virtualization enhanced model, and there's a CIB9470. The 9220 is a 2U cluster in a box unit with two blade servers. The CIB9470 is a 70 disk unit that also has two blade servers. The blade servers of both cluster in a box units have a pair of E5 Intel Xeon processors and are rated at up to 256 gig of RAM. All the blade servers have onboard SSD drives in a RAID 1 configuration for their operating system. And then we use the JBOD capacity for our storage spaces, our shared cluster data. 9220 has 12 3.5 inch drives, the 9470 has 70 3.5 inch drives. You might look at that 2U cluster in a box unit and think it doesn't have much storage capacity. Can I expand it? The answer is yes, you can. You can attach on a JBOT, in this case a DNS 1600D, which features 24 three and a half inch drives, and we can connect both blade servers to that JBOT. And that increases the capacity of the cluster in the CIB unit by 24 drives. Now our storage space can be much bigger, and our shared cluster storage has a greater capacity. 
Another solution is where we daisy chain a pair of CIBs together. So here you can see a pair of 9220s connected together. Now the four servers that you find in both enclosures are in the same cluster and they share their JBOTs together. So the server in or the servers in enclosure one can connect to the disks in enclosure two and vice versa. So we have a single pool or capacity of disks. Another solution is where we have a pair of CIB units and they are both connected to a common JBOT. In this case, the DNS 1600D. So now we have 12 disks in enclosure one, 12 disks in enclosure two, and 24 disks in the JBOD, giving us quite a bit of capacity. Now that's all great for smaller deployments. What about a larger deployment? And that's where we get something called a scale-out file server. Before I talk about the scale-out file server, I want to remind you of the architecture of a SAN, because a lot of people look at scale-out file server and think that's very new and very alien, but to be quite honest, it's not. The concepts or the high-level architecture of the scale-out file server are based on what you've been doing for the last 10 or 15 years with a SAN. A SAN has one or more disk trays, and by itself, or by themselves, each of the disks in those disk trays is an individual unit. The cleverness or the intelligence of a SAN is provided by specialized servers called SAN controllers. Those SAN controllers use storage virtualization or disk virtualization to aggregate the disks of those disk trays together. And then when we create a LUN, each LUN resides across each of the disks in those pools. And that's when we deploy our disk fault tolerance. Our application servers, whether they be SQL servers, Oracle servers, Hyper-V hosts, or whatever, connect to those SAN controllers using switches. Using a protocol such as iSCSI, Fiber Channel, FCOE, or even SAS. Now, let's compare that to a scale-out file server, which is not that different. We have one or more disk trays in the form of a JBOD. The JBOD has lots of individual disks. We connect two to eight file servers to those JBOTs. And we implement clustered storage spaces using failover clustering. That makes those scale-out file server nodes highly available. Using clustered storage spaces, we get disk virtualization, so that aggregates the disks together and gives us fault-tolerant virtual disks. On the cluster, we implement a special role called a scale-out file server or the file server for application data. And that gives us the continuously available, transparent failover file server role. So we create file shares that reside on the JBOD and are active active across each of the nodes in that scale out file server cluster. Then we have our application servers. So in most cases that's going to be Hyper-V, but it could be IIS and it could be SQL Server. Those application servers connect to the scale-out file server using the SMB3 protocol instead of iSCSI or Fiber Channel or FCOE. SMB3 gives us high performance throughput and low latency throughput to our storage using SMB multi-channel, which leverages um, RSS on the physical NICs, and potentially using RDMA or remote direct memory access which is made possible using special NICs that do something like iWarp or InfiniBand. The Scale-Out File Server is a software-defined solution that makes it flexible and easy to automate using PowerShell or System Center. Where the SAN is expensive, the Scale-Out File Server costs a fraction of the price. And that price differential is more evident as you move up the scalability ladder. The performance is comparable. There's plenty of information published by Microsoft and third parties to show you how well storage spaces and a scale-out file server can perform. An SMB3 storage is Microsoft's strategic data protocol in the data center. Not only is it being used for scale-out file server, but it's also being used for deployment by Virtual Machine Manager and live migration within Hyper-V. SMB3 is the future and software-defined storage 
is also the future of the data center. Let's have a look at a few designs of scale out file servers. So let's start with a simple one. We're going to have a single JBOD and a pair of nodes in our scale out file server. In other words, a pair of SAN controllers. Here I have my DNS1640 JBOD that gives me 24 two and a half inch drives, which could be SSDs and or HDDs. And I'm going to have a pair of storage controllers. Now these are a pair of Windows Server 2012 or 2 clustered servers. Each server has a dual interface SAS card, looking familiar, and each SAS card is dual or is cross connected to each of the SAS uh, modules in the JBOD. We create a cluster, we deploy cluster shared volumes on the JBOD, we deploy the scale out file server role onto the cluster, and then we create file shares that are active active across the cluster and are stored on that JBOD. Now we can deploy a bunch of Hyper-V hosts and instead of directly creating CSVs on those Hyper-V hosts, we simply store our virtual machines on file shares that reside in the scale-out file server architecture. Now let's scale that out. And here's an architecture that we're seeing being used quite a bit now in the hosting business. Instead of being limited to one JBOD, Let's put in four big JBOTs, each of these having 60 physical disk slots. We can have over a petabyte of raw capacity on this entire architecture. And we're going to have four storage nodes, or SAN controllers, in this architecture. Each of those servers in our cluster has a pair of quad interface 12 gigabits per second SAS cards. And each server is directly connected to each JBOD. Now we can deploy lots and lots of Hyper-V hosts that connect to this architecture using SMB3 networking. Probably 10 gigabits per second iWarp or 56 gigabits per second InfiniBand. This is a huge architecture, but it's a lot cheaper than the SAN alternative. How much cheaper? Well, let's have a look at a few pricing scenarios. I'm going to warn you in advance, all the pricing here is indicative retail pricing. First one is a simple solution. Let's have a look at a single JBOD, the 2U 1640 JBOD, that is going to have 4 terabytes of usable 10K hard disk capacity. We have our JBOD, the DNS 1640. We'll put in 10 900 gig drives and we're going to be implementing a two-way mirror which is going to half our raw capacity to give us our usable capacity. We will have two SAS cards rated at 12 gigabits per second and we're going to have four SAS cables. That solution is going to cost you just over 7,700 euros or just over 6,100 pounds. Note that I have not included the cost of any servers and that's an additional cost and we don't distribute servers at Micro Warehouse. Now let's have a look at a cluster in a box unit. We'll have the 2U9220 from data on and we're going to put 16 terabytes of usable tiered storage into that cluster in a box unit. This is going to be a full two node cluster that could be a small scale out file server or it could be a Hyper-V cluster for a branch office or a small business. We have the CIB9220. We're going to put four 200 gig SSDs in for our hot tier. We'll have four two and a half inch to three and a half inch adapters for those SSDs because the CIB has three of three and a half inch disk slots and the SSDs are two and a half inches. And there are eight four terabyte 7200 RPM drives, giving us our cold tier and our bulk cheap capacity. The entire solution is going to cost just over 16,700 euros or just under 13 and a half thousand pounds. That's an entire cluster for that price. Now let's look at the cost of the big scale out file server solution that I showed you earlier with 600 terabytes of usable tiered storage. This is a solution that would cost hundreds of thousands of euros from your traditional block storage vendors 
and it's one of those things that makes a storage salesman or saleswoman do their happy dance. With this solution, we're going to use four of the DNS 1660J bots from Data On. We're going to have 40 SSDs, 10 200 gig SSDs in each J bot. We'll also require 40 of the 2.5 inch to 3.5 inch adapters for those SSDs. And we're going to have 206 terabyte 7200 RPM drives. That gives us our cold tier capacity, that huge block of storage that makes up the bulk of that 600 terabytes for our cold blocks. Remember, the hot blocks are going to live on that highly performing SSD tier. We'll have 8 12 gigabits per second SAS cards and 32 gig or 32 SAS cables to directly connect the four servers to each of the JBOTs. That entire solution is going to cost 188,000 euros or 150,000 pounds. Sounds like a huge amount of money, but try price that solution from your from your preferred block storage vendor. 600 terabytes of usable tiered storage at well over a petabyte of raw capacity. So how do you purchase data on storage? There's a good chance that you're going to struggle finding a reseller in your country that sells data on. If you are having trouble finding a distributor or a reseller, then contact Micro Warehouse. If you're an end customer, the person who's going to use the storage, tell your preferred reseller to contact Micro Warehouse on www.mwh.ie or if you are one of those system integrators or consulting companies that sells hardware and licensing to your customers, you can contact us too and we'll sell to you. Thank you for tuning into this video. I hope it's been educational. Goodbye.